everyone, welcome to another edition of Creative Current. I'm your host, Shane Anise Dambrot, and with us today in the studio is artist, impresario, man about town, Mark Stephen Greenfield, whose new show, a survey of work done over the last several years in different series, recently opened at Off Ramp Gallery in Altadena. And we'll talk about that and a few other things along the way. Hello, Mark. Hello, Shannon. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really excited because um, I'm, you're somebody that I would have wanted to talk to anyway for this series because you have, first of all, I'm a huge fan of your work. And second of all, you have a really unique perspective on the art world in Los Angeles uh, from a couple of different sides over your career. So, um, but I think everybody really wants me to start with the art itself and get to the other politics and stuff later. <laughs> so um, what's great about the show that's up for the next several weeks at least at, uh, at Off Ramp, which is an amazing, for those who don't know, is an amazing craftsman house that's kind of a venue destination on its own. So it's a pretty great place to show, uh, to show art. And I'm wondering if you could tell the people a little bit about what's there and then also talk a little bit about what isn't there so that we can understand you know, the whole sort of okay. evolution. Okay. Yeah, my work has been dealing with identity for the last 10 years uh, through a, a number of series. The first one uh, was actually called um, Black Atcha. <laughs> and then <laughs> from Black Atcha. I do love your title. We went to Incognito. Incognito. And then we went to Mammy Graphs. Uh huh. And uh, the, show, the last show at Off Ramp was called uh, Dudas. Animalicious uh, is the latest series of work, and it deals with um, the animated characters that were produced back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and, and beyond that were uh, about the African-American stereotype. A lot of these cartoons have been banned. A lot of them are not in distribution anymore or been pulled for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that they're so offensive. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <You know>? They're <laughs> over-racist. They're yeah. over the top. Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, um, the thing is, I, I, in some reading that I did a few years ago about um, the work of the shadow, the shadow mm -hmm. that exists in everybody, it's the type of thing that if you don't um, embrace it and take the power away from it, it has ways of coming out and biting you, biting you in ways you have no control over. So you're talking about this Jungian idea of everyone's shadow self. Right, right, right. And so this constitutes a very, very damaging shadow that... Um, I'm forcing people to look at it in a different way. I'm creating a different context for it. Uh, the, the elements that look like design in my work are actually um, a kind of mental and psychological mapping that takes place. And so when you see this, it's, it's very chaotic, the, the, the design elements, and it more or less forces you to then look at the figure, which itself is unsettling. Okay? Mm -hmm. But in doing that, there's a certain um, therapeutic effect that takes place that allows you to get beyond it. Right, and, these and it's also that, humor. It's humor, it's very one, seductive, it right. pulls you in. It's very beautiful and very obsessive and very de finely detailed, that's the sort of background mm -hmm. you're talking about, the design element would be the sort of, it's like it's abstract, except it's not plain. It's very, very full of right. mark making. And, you know, but the mark and, making also has characteristics of automatic writing. Okay. Which is about, you know, which is one of those surrealist practices. Mm -hmm. So then by the time you sort of get through all of that emotional field and you're looking at the figure, what you might see would be, for example, um, giant afros, you had the gold Not tooth in the one you, well, the one you sent me had the crazy like bone hair. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the gold the the gold <laughs> right. dice for tea. <laughs> right, right. And it was called something like, Who'll buy me a drink? Somebody buy me a drink. Yeah, somebody buy me a and drink. And then he's holding a bottle of poison. Right, okay, and so that's kind of what I was getting at with this aspect of humor because for me, I look at that and part of me wants to laugh because it's so over the top, but it's not really funny mm -hmm. when you think about it at all. And I'd maybe talk a little bit about, because that's a tension that appears um, in all of the different kinds of work Actually, that I've seen. Actually, you really just nailed it because it causes you to think about it, okay? You have to suspend that the inclination to go towards the humorous in it. Which is the safe place. Which is the safe place and which is where people go initially. And then after that, you have to like deconstruct it and really take, take it apart and figure out what this is really doing to a person's psyche. 
You know, I look at it in this really interesting way that, that uh, when you look at people that are in their 60s, 70s, or 80s now, they grew up on this stuff. Right. And so their per perceptions were really colored by that to a large degree. They said, oh, that's what black people are about. Well, they're children. There aren't any real black people in the neighborhood exactly. or their school. So that's what they got And no to one's work telling with. them it's a bad thing. And then they are ill prepared for the life as it exactly. is lived <laughs> later. Exactly, you know. Right, right. And, and the other thing that I was looking at was the fact that there's been an entire generation that doesn't know these things ever existed. Right, and that, that's kind of what I thought when you were talking about them being banned. Because I'm thinking to myself, I get why they would be banned. Mm -hmm. That's an impulse to keep this poison out of the minds of, for example, our children. But then you wind up with generations who don't understand what the problem was. And they don't understand sometimes why people are treating them the way they do. Because they may have been raised on this stuff. And we're at a point, actually, in, in our, our country's history where we can talk about these things now, where it's become more important. You know, the election, people don't understand the, the, the significance of the election of, of somebody like Barack, okay? And that now all these warts and things that people are trying to cover up, are, they're coming out in ways. Well, yeah, well Alabama is, very good is, is arguing to the Supreme Court, like, right now, that everything's cool with voting and racism in Alabama, and not to sweat yeah. it. And Lake, Elena Kagan had to say, "Aren't isn't Al, isn't your county mm -hmm. the one who, where we started the voting rights?" Well, act? you know, a couple of years ago, people like, were running around saying that we'd reached an era of post-racialism. Oh yeah, or post-black. How did you feel about I'm that? Saying, oh, right. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I, maybe you know you've reached a particular class where it's not affecting you, but that doesn't mean that it's gone. Right. It's affecting all kinds of other people that you may not be aware of because of the bubble that you live in. Right. And I think, in my opinion, I think that's one of the reasons your work is so successful is that it goes back into causes and roots and history of po popular images. And so that it doesn't come across as polemic because it's not about the Selby County, Alabama lawsuit at the Supreme Court right now, even mm -hmm. though it kind of is. <laughs> but. You made, you've been making this work longer than that case has been there. Mm -hmm. But you know the idea is that the work can be about the current political, socio-political climate in which it's being made, but that it can use visual cues that are from other eras and have other associations in emotion and nostalgia and humor and things that you know only people over a certain age will even recognize. Right. And that that, I think, also, along with humor, makes a kind of strategy of access to the work for other people. For example, a lot of people um, um, love the um, ophthalmological charts. Oh, the eye that, charts. Yeah. The eye charts yeah. mm -hmm. that, for, that they recently saw as part of the wildly popularly acclaimed Jack Redberg show, Letters from Los Angeles. That show was actually about contemporary artists using text and words as an element of composition and meaning in their work. Because yeah, the text that I would use in those things oftentimes were taken from the lyrics of hip hop. Thanks. It seduces you, it pulls you in because you're, you're curious. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was growing up, whenever I'd say, see an eye chart, I'd try to take, make some sort of word out of it. Like, yeah. What's going on here? And then after you engage with it, then it hits you with a hammer. And then the the, the the text that you read becomes much more relevant to you, and it causes you then to do that introspection that forces you to look at your own feelings about race. Right, with eyesight as a helpfully provided metaphor right. for how you see things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just so tight conceptually. They're just so self-contained. That's why I keep referring to them as series, because I know they're sort of all ongoing all the time if you feel like it, nothing's like over. But I really, you know, that one is so just, you know, the symmetry of that. It's testing your vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just amazed. That, that does the critic's job for the, all the words are right there. I don't even need it. I'm know. amazed the work is getting as much attention now that it is because it was done 12, 14 years ago. Okay, so it, 14, so, but it wasn't, re, was it shown? I mean, it, it was shown. It, okay. Yeah. What do you think that's about? Why do you think people are, I think it might have something to do with what we were talking about in terms of my other career. The people who already knew you as an artist maybe didn't realize the extent of your city arts career 
and vice versa. Um, because there were a few reasons for keeping them sort of separate, but part of the reason that you are showing so much now and more than um, you have been this whole time is because you were a pretty big muckety-muck over at the Department of Cultural Affairs in different aspects um, and different departments and different projects, and you were at the Watts Towers, and you were, all, you were at many different places over a long and um, really fascinating career with the city, which, God, we could do a whole show just on that and what <laughs> that's been like. Um, I think it might be kind of worth you discussing for a minute how that has affected the kind of work you've done, because mm -hmm. in your work within the Department of Cultural Affairs, you had a very hands-on role in the last few decades of civic arts policy in Los Angeles. Um, not that you were in charge of all of it, but you were certainly right there. Um, and then, meanwhile, you're making this work, which is um, very specifically um, delving into issues of racial identity and politics, um, especially you know around here. I, I often tell people the best job I ever had was when I was a janitor because it's mindless work. You just sit there and you can think about all the creative possibilities while you're mopping somebody's floor. Um, and so I always worked a job to support my ability to do my work. And it also gave me the freedom of doing work that oftentimes was not popular, that was also not marketable. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, and it, gave me, it gave me an interesting freedom. The downside of that, of course, was that it saps your energy and it doesn't allow you to do as much work as you'd like to. So over the years, the jobs that I took started to require more and more of my time and required more and more responsibility. Uh, and so by the time I had gotten to uh, the Municipal Art Gallery, I was, I was spending much too much time doing administrative work and not enough time doing my work. And it, it, I, was, I just wasn't happy anymore. And, um, Although the work you were doing with the city itself, was, you could make an argument, was important. And over, there was overlap with your areas of interest. Interesting you should say that, because one of the things that I, I deluded myself into ah. to, <laughs> to <laughs> well, there it is then. was that, um, <laughs> that there, you know, there is such a thing as, as community practice in art. And so in when fact, I was, you're teaching a class I'm teaching called a class in that community practice. at right. CalArts right now. Right. So. And it's interesting because there is a dearth of information on it. And so you know, we're kind of doing step by step on this thing. But um, in talking with a colleague, you know, he was telling me, he used to make objects, and he was saying sometimes working in community can be just as challenging as making objects because some of the negotiations that you have to go through politically and socially and in community and you know, the definition of what community is and what it constitutes. And, you know, he said that what you leave as a result of the work that you do in community is in itself an art, and it's something that is self-sustaining and self-fulfilling and self-evolving. And so, you know, I look back at some of the seeds that he planted when he was working with me and Watts, and some of those things went on to become very successful, and it changed people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what we want our art to do, is change people's consciousness. Right. You know, and so... I was able to justify it. <laughs> so you could stretch it I out a little bit. I massaged it in such a way where it's like, oh, okay, this is, right. this is better. But by the time I got into the Municipal Art Gallery, all that stuff went by the wayside. It right. Was just, and you were just over it. I mean, we just read it. You wanted yeah. to be showing. You had all this work. And then, of course, there's the other sort of little mini political side to that, which is, like we were talking about before, if, you know, not that you were sort of like, you know, the grand vizier of the, of the individual artist grant program, but, you know, you're there, you're at Barnsdale, that's what's happening. And then, you know, on the days when you're not at work, are you supposed to be approaching the same galleries where those artists show? I didn't even feel I could. And I mean, right, I mean, that is a very, you, I can, never, be a, you can be an honest person all day long, but that's going to look weird. The whole time I weird, worked for Cultural right? Affairs, I never applied for a grant. Right. I never applied for a residency because I felt I didn't, I didn't need to compete with people on that level. Exactly. It and wasn't then, my place to and do plus, that. Right, and, and of course... I don't think anyone, now in seeing the work, I mean, it's weird because I think people probably, because it's you and who you are and how good the work is and what that is, people would actually be fine with it. It would not be an abuse of power because anyone who knows you knows that you're not a power abuser. However, that would have looked really strange. Yeah. So I yeah. know why you couldn't do it. So There's an um, expression in the city. It, are you happy? Oh, expression. There's an expression in the city that you said. It's called the appearance of evil. It doesn't mean that you're actually doing anything that's evil. No. But it looks it, it that looks way. It looks that way. <laughs> you know? Right. And then, of course, that redounds back on the organization itself. Right. And not everyone involved. And it's just a mess. 
and not worth it. So yeah. couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> but you weren't running away. You were running toward because since then, so when I met you, you were on. You were going to leave. It was all planned. It was about to happen. And you were saying, I can't wait to get you know back into the studio. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I can't wait to see what comes out of that. I didn't really know. And then, bam, it was like six months. And here's Doodah getting shown. And sure. here's, you know, and all of a sudden I start seeing your work in a lot of places. And I thought, well, you know, hell, he wasn't kidding. Like, he had this ready to go. This is amazing. How did you keep this, you know, to yourself all this time? And so what has been um, the reaction of your, in the last couple of years? It's been... Overwhelmingly positive. Um, people have been very supportive. I think that um, those people that I wasn't able to show at Barnes Doll have forgiven me. <laughs> right? I think that uh, the relationships that it's very interesting. None of the relationships that I made with galleries while I was at Barnes Doll are places that I'm showing it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Right. But it's funny because you're showing it off ramp, which is amazing. Sort of indie. I mean, you know, it's a little, it's a little independent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know. And then, you know, Jack Redford at yeah, the LA Art yeah. Show. And then, you know, places in between. Um, you're curating, um, a, I guess, sort of still, although the model is very different. Right. Um, and, but know, I also have an ethics where I will not put myself in a show that I curate. And oh, I some people think some way. people think that's old school. I you know, think, I, I, I had an argument with somebody it's about classy. that. I just think that the attention should be put on the artists that are in the show. Right. That's your old career as a civic yeah, I think civil it's, servant I think it is. rearing it's, it's, its ugly it's, head. It's, it goes back to that. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you should be a little bit more selfish. You're probably it. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Everyone feels the need, to, feels compelled to say how much they love the work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like people are really. I've seen a lot of support. I'm glad you're feeling it because mm -hmm. I feel like I can see it. Too. Just to clarify, seven of the pieces were shown in the Cola show. Okay. And eight of the pieces are brand new. Right. The Cola Show being the City of Los Angeles Individual Artist Grant, you mysteriously won like 20 minutes after you retired <laughs> from the organization, which weirdly, I feel like nobody was, you know, said anything. Well, it was one of the worst publicized Cola Shows that they've ever had. That's a good point. <laughs> All right, so we've covered the eye charts, mm -hmm. um, which were the 12 to 14 years ago, but which I first saw for the first time at around the same time that I saw the doodah pieces. Right. And the doodah pieces, which are sort of the forefather of the animalicious pieces, exactly. um, also present a sort of a very densely detailed, kind of obsessively automate, automatic drawing kind mm -hmm. of background. They're all black and white. And then out of that background, um, images of portraiture emerge, which um, the portraits mostly were, have to do with blackface. They were all, the, all the portraits were of blackface performers. Right. Some of them were actually African Americans in blackface. Which is crazy. Which is crazy. Right. But, you know, at the point where African Americans were able to actually get on stage and do this, people were actually demanding, we want to see the genuine article. We're tired of seeing these guys in makeup. And then the art, general article came on stage and they said, oh, they're not black enough. So then you had, you had black people that actually had to put on blackface makeup in order to perform, you know, the most famous of which was Burt Williams, who was, in his time, the highest paid African American performer in the world. Wow. And that's what he had to do. That's what he had to do. But, you know, doodah, yeah. right? It's yeah. just a trifle, not a big deal. People just think of a certain thing, they hear black. But I mean, again, wouldn't it be so great if that was just a completely historical Mode. I mean, I think about 10 days ago, like the lawyer for the Anti-Defamation League went to a forum party in blackface mm -hmm. and couldn't mm -hmm. understand why people were so mad. And I'm like, my friend, you work for the Anti-Defamation League, which granted is oriented towards making sure my people aren't horribly offended by anything ever, mm -hmm. you know, in the tribe there. But you would think that that sensibility of sensitivity would be able to transfer into his personal life to at least enough of a degree that he wouldn't allow himself to be photographed in blackface. But maybe that was his shadow talking. Right. Okay. And so there's these things that keep coming up. And I'm hearing you talk about what well, the people thought the black performed. They wanted a black guy. The black guy wasn't black enough. And I'm sorry, but I'm hearing that. And I'm thinking about a lot of the messed up dialogue that's going around about our president right now. 
I mean, I campaigned for him in Nevada, and I had people tell me, oh, I'm just going to vote for the white hat. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, sir, I'm going to totally just back up toward the car. Like, you can't yell at someone in that moment. You want them to be able to take that step in their lives and mm -hmm. do that. But that is still coming out of their mouth. They're reaching to vote for Barack Obama, and they're saying, they're saying fucked up racial things right. at the same moment as they're voting for the man to be their president. So how, what is that contradiction? And I see a lot of that kind of that, you know, asking, answering, asking, answering going on in your work. Okay, so then you said there was a fourth, um, um, there was a, a series that I have, you know I haven't seen. Mammy Graphs. The Mammy Graphs. That was shown at the Wignall Museum. Okay, talk yeah. a little bit about those. Uh, that was actually kind of a, now that would, was a combination of a number of different, different series. So there was some things from Black Gatcha in there. There were things from Incognito in there. There were some things from Othello's Ghost, uh, which was another series. Um, so yeah, there, there were about three different series in that one, and that was a it was a large exhibit. Yeah, and you know. a, a regional museum. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, one of the things that I wanted to to point out though is that because oftentimes I get asked this by people, how do other African Americans feel about your work? Because it is so politically charged. And I think it's really important to, to uh, put that in context. Please. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I can't be judgmental of people with regards to my work because it's all based on their threshold for tolerance. And what I find is I had a great deal of difficulty uh, convincing my mother that what I was doing wasn't something that was completely insane. <laughs> and she's, she's come around, bless her heart, but it's taken her a long time. And I had to really take that apart and understand where it was coming from. And you know, people of her generation lived through this. Mm -hmm. And so they saw it firsthand. And so they have a very visceral reaction to it. My generation, I think, processes it a little bit differently, but still out of deference to the older generation, they oftentimes adopt those attitudes. The younger generation looks at that and they said, that's historically important. It's interesting. It's not me. Right. And that's what, I, that's what I thrive on, is because they're, they're saying, OK, it's historically important. It needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be taken apart. But it's not me. And right. so that's kind of the attitude that I approach the work with, because I don't identify with those figures. And anybody that does has a problem, I think. <laughs> but at the same time, I, you know, I try not to be judgmental of them. In, in where they are mm -hmm. in terms of you know, dealing with the work. Well, it's, it's sort of analogous to, I think, some conversations around things like feminism, for example, meet across that generational divide, mm -hmm. where people my mother's age were like, you need to respect the craziness that we went through so that you could have a life where you don't have to care about this. Mm -hmm. And then now I've lived long enough to see the sort of threat to it kind of come back around with this whole, you know, war on women thing and our political structure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I took a lot, there were about 20 years there in the middle where I took a lot of freedom for granted that I'm now watching on the news and in the culture war has sort of come back under assault. And I feel like I should call up all the people in college that I told were wasting their time with feminism and apologize to them. Because it turns out, we should have been. Pay we should be paying attention, and so I feel like, you know, there's a little bit of, um, you know, just like an echo of that when it comes to how we're talking about race in the, you know, in the country. I wonder, um, finally, if um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's sort of now and next. I mean, I know you work on sort of all these things mm -hmm. as you want when they come up, but this feels like you've been working on this series, and now it's shown. Mm -hmm. It's cola in here. So what uh, what's coming? Uh, I'm doing a residency this coming summer in Salvador Bahia in Brazil. Oh. And I fully expect oh my that God. that experience is going to change my work significantly. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. How long are you going to be there? I'll be there for two months. Two months. And is it like a, a, an exchange or there's a museum there or what? How did it, uh, this how did is it through the Sakatar Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they usually take uh, anywhere from seven to nine residents at a time. Uh, some of them are from the United States, a lot of them are international, and you have an opportunity to interact with them on a regular basis. And they try to, uh, to curate these things in such a way where there's some, that all of the residents have something in common. So okay. there's something to so What's the, the thing that your group uh, has in common? It's going to be 
uh, about the African diaspora. Oh and gosh. I think there's going to be a curator there from a museum in Nigeria, and mm. I think people from the Caribbean, and other people from the United States. And so How fantastic. It's going to be fascinating. Oh my god, I guess yeah. the people that applied for grants during your tenure should be grateful that you kept your hands off because you've gotten them all now. <laughs> it's like two years and you're, you know, represent, you're like a cultural diplomat. Yeah. Okay. Good thing you weren't. Didn't think you didn't compete with them. No, that's great. Congratulations. I mean, that's really perfect, and that's uh, exactly what you should be doing. I'm really happy about that. Okay. Well, thank you for coming in, and thank, thank you. you for being patient with my meandering oh, today. That was fantastic. Maybe you come back after the residency and let us know what's going on, what went on. I'd love to. Okay, great. Okay. And thank you at home for sticking with another edition of Creative Current. Um, we'll be back next week.